Hello and welcome to the Eastern Kicks podcast, a fortnightly magazine program about East Asian film, led by me, Andrew Heskins, founder and grandmaster of EasternKicks.com, and James Mudge, our leading writer. Hey, Each episode, we'll be taking a look at the latest films, news, festivals, and often chatting to filmmakers and stars along the way. This episode, we've gone a bit J-horror, or should that be Takeshi Squared? As we discuss Mickey's new romance, First Love, <laughs> out in UK cinemas in time for Valentine's Day. We'll also be chatting about The Grudge and series creator Takeshi Sumishu, who has a new film out in Japan, Howling Village. We'll be joined by Ant Gates. Hello. And later on, Nina Doherty. But let's get to the important thing first. What are you drinking this episode, James? Oh, I have a very uh, right fancy uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, and I have a hip flask full of the finest grouse. Very nice. Indeed. And you? I am mm-hmm. drinking a single malt whiskey, the Glenlivet, with one ice cube. Uh, founders Reserve, it, it seems. It's um, very fancy. Yeah, very nice, very fruity. <laughs> After taste of toffee, vanilla. A few notes. Another famous grouse here. <laughs> and this week I'm on Crate IPA. Mm. Complex bold with lots of juicy hops. What's the percentage? Uh, 6%. Uh, that's proper. So let's get started. Mm. This week we're going to focus on the release of First Love from Takeshi Miike. Right in time for Valentine's Day. So uh, I think, mm. you know, Ants, if you could kind of lead yeah, us into okay. to what the story is about in terms right. of a romantic... How romantic is it? You yeah, know, what what's the synopsis of it's this? It's clearly a date movie. It's clearly a date movie. <laughs> so date movie. You've, got, you've got this young guy. <laughs> I know, it's Takeshi Miike date movie. Well, compared to audition. So audition was a date movie. Just, <laughs> it was. It was. was. And that's... I think, yeah. <laughs> Depends who you take, I suppose, isn't it? That's part of it, isn't it, really? Yeah. You've got to be careful who you take to these sort of deep date movies. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a teeny... It's a, it's clearly aimed at a kind of teeny audience. I think us middle-aged men maybe won't get the same... Won't I, get the I, same I, date. I'm in my early 30s. Yeah? OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just aged. I'm just aged badly. Mm. So you've got, you've got this young guy who's a boxer, a guy called Leo... <laughs> Who's the kind of classic, where you describe him as like fop head kind of... Floppy fringe and He's very right. pretty, he's very pretty. And he's a boxer, and he's very good at boxing, mm. but he isn't very driven. So he's one of these, he's good at boxing, but he doesn't care. Mm. He doesn't do mm. a... His, his coach berates him at the beginning for not going, woo, yay, give him like a big high five when he wins a fight. I remember So he doesn't know where he's going, he's that, and he's... So we're with him. And then we're kind of introduced to lots of other people and all their paths cross in a classic kind of ensemble, Mickey kind of way. So his sort of to-be love interest is a young woman called Monica, I think her name was. And, yeah, she's hooked on drugs and she's been used as a prostitute to pay off her father's gambling debts. Mm. Uh, and she's quite interesting because when she gets stressed and when there's some threat, she sees the threat as her father, who we assume, by the way, he's dressed, you know, abused her in some way. <clears throat> yeah. Mm. Um, so it's just basically this old guy with big kind of glasses in his big pants and um, and, it, and it's kind of funny and scary at the same time um, and they end up meeting through it's kind of Yakuza stuff he ends up she's running away from a crooked cop at one point and he clotheslines the cop who is the guy who played Ichi the Killer who played um, What's Ichi I, I never picked it's him oh, yeah it's him never, now yeah, something nice. I forget his name it's now Dude. Cool. God, the cop called Tomo, who's crooked cop, who's working some other gangs. It all gets very gangster, yeah, yeah, yeah. complicated, uh, mixing with some now, Chinese right. gangsters. That's yeah, very cool. I never realised yeah. that. Yeah, nice. Not, and you look at him, you go, oh, yeah, but he's kind of a bit older. And no, I can see it. No, you fucking see him. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, he, he's not as crazy as, as <laughs> Ichi. But he's well, still broken. He's moderating it a, you know, a little bit. <laughs> channeled channeled it back. back. Channeled it back a bit. Yeah. A bit this, is, more. this is Mike Light. I think is the best way to describe it. So Leo Dex, Tomo, the crooked cop, and mm. kind of saves Monica, and then they're kind of on the run, and they're chased by gangsters. There's a big fight at the end, and yeah. That's not even a spoiler. That's not even a spoiler. <laughs> you kind of, it's, it goes, it goes where you want it to go, where you expect it yeah. to go. It's, I, I liked it, mm. Mm. but it was a kind of, it's like a pick and mix of all the things that I liked about some of his previous movies, all mixed in. Yeah, yeah. You know, sort of. I, I, I mean, I was going to say, we kind of kind of BK light, as you said earlier. And, yeah. and actually, what is quite nice about it is that it, unlike some of the stuff that Mike has done in, in some ways, it's, it's kind of harking back to, you can go, well, that's very Mike, that's very Mike, yeah. that's very Mike. Yeah. But 
It's all done in a very kind of toned down fashion. Yeah, it's very colourful. Touches yeah. on those those it's, aspects. It's, I mean, it's still. I don't, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I thought colourful was the word. It's, mm. it's so chaotic. Um, I I don't know. It, it just didn't feel like he was, you know, that invested in making it. And I thought the casual misogyny, you know, like put me off with it. But Monica, her character is, it's a pretty bad character. Yeah, it's you know, weird it to have. Any, she doesn't make any sense. Yeah, she's she's, a, she's just there. A prostitute. For, Who's you know, yeah. forced into prostitution and but she's still, drug addict. You know, he still looks oh, like a pop star. She's still pretty and you still yeah, going, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's exactly. nice. Exactly, that's what I mean. How it's... do you make light of that? But every, everything is so crazy and over the top that it's it's never going to be a social realist well, no, deconstruction. No, no, still, of, uh, but I, I, I didn't problem. think that he actually seemed to care, despite the name of the film and everything, I don't think he seemed to get too much of a care about the romance aspect. He doesn't even talk to her. I mean, no, they for, they, for nearly, chair, for, they nearly hold hands at one point. Yeah, he but. he doesn't slap her around, which makes a nice change. But <laughs> it, it's still not really a. It, it's still like a oh fucking damsel. Well, it's first love. You, you could yeah. say that the, the female characters then, aren't yeah. particularly well dealt with. And I, I would see. Yeah, I, I, they need I, each other. Audition aside and stuff, mo- it's, mm. you can say that about a lot of his stuff. But yeah. this one, I thought, I don't know. I, I still, I fairly enjoyed the film, but, but it is enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. I, I just very. Particularly when you get to the last act, where it is all the kind of running around and the hardware shot. Yeah, that, you get a few. You get a yeah, few that was I thought nice the weakest bit. That the fights were not particularly well choreographed. I agree on for with a bit. that. Yeah, they, they just seemed to be like. It he, was a good ending, and everybody got the comeuppance that yeah, you kind of expect or wanted. wanted but, and they, as characters, they needed each other, which was interesting. You know. She saw him was like, that's my way out because he's good in a fight and he can save me. Even though, she was, like, even though she was crazy and she didn't seem to understand who he was half the time. No, which is understandable, you know, given the situation. <laughs> well, yeah. Coming but it up was more, the, actually, the supporting character is more interesting. Their stories. I agree with that, but we're, the, we're the same for him with I like, my failure of pronunciation with Shota. <laughs> you know, he, he's very... Shota Sometani. I don't know, close Something enough, I guess, but he, he was very... And apologies good. again for that he pronunciation. Was, he's, the gang, he's, the, he's the Yakuza who's trying to screw over the other, and it, should, it exactly. almost, all kicks off with a drug deal going wrong, yeah, and he pops he, in league with this He's got his mad schemes, man. Yeah, and obviously it goes mad to up as mad schemes. Could but he's, he is very enjoyable as an actor in this film. Um, uh, he's very good in this. You know, yeah. I'd, I'd say he... You he's know. very laid back and he always feels like he's in control. He, he's the most interesting yeah. character in the film. He I is, mean, actually. He's the, kind the, of always under, a bit underdeveloped really. because you kind of feel like he's... And he always weedles his way out of all the problems in the film, which is quite and, nice. And into more problems, which, <laughs> and is, which problems, is really yeah. funny. Some of, the, some of the... Yeah, his schemes are... I mean, they're frankly ridiculous. So schemes, they don't make any goddamn sense. Mm. But he drive, he's the one who actually drives the narrative of the film, not the romance at all. And yeah, they, those I, two people wouldn't have met if it wasn't for him. I mean, I saw like the poster for the film and stuff. It looks like, you know, some mad... You know, manga type poster and everything. They're pulling up the love angle. That's that's no, it's not. Well, I say after the leading. Valentine's Day release. Yeah, that's not smart. You can see it's a date movie because you know that. Well, any pa- movie's a date movie. Perhaps a young, yeah. I mean, we perhaps really a young listen. teenager. I don't know. Would I, take I, the girl I, that he likes, but he doesn't know well enough, and it's a safe option because <laughs> it's I, a bit crazy, but not too crazy. Well, and he's pretty, and she can go at the very least. I mean, gender. Oh, you know. I, I remember exactly. my better half saying yeah. that the <laughs> her face first date movie was a Razorhead. So you no, can only go up from that, can't you? Really. I, I don't know. <laughs> Razorhead is. A, I mean, that's probably that's, more that's romantic than first love. Mm. There's more romance yeah. in it. Well, there's more yeah. commitment. In it. Yeah, there's kind of there's there is more. Yeah. I mean, in first love, they don't really seem to give that much of a fuck. And no. She's off. She's off her nut, and he's. Yeah. You know, he doesn't really seem to know what's going on either. So it's. I liked the character Julie when she came in. I think she was a, a musician. Oh, a she's pop star. Funny. And she was, you know, classic overacting. Yeah. Angry, and when when the the Chinese gangsters when they kind of go, we need to call so and so in to get yeah, Monica yeah. back. They call in Julie. Do you assume it's going to be a man? Because the way they talk yeah. about it, just because it's a man and, and this kind of skinny, kind of cool Japanese girl turns up, lady turns up, and she's brilliant and she totally overacts in the best she way possible. She was funny that she's swinging her baseball bat. And there's a, a nice scene time. when she, one of the guys that tries to stop her and she tries to be the, oh, I'm the victim, and tries to lure him in <laughs> to get him to, you know, potentially like, take advantage of her and she just kicks the shit out of him. He's a Chinese fellow, isn't it? Or yeah. one of the assassins sitting after him and his yeah. Mandarin I, acting is pretty appalling. You were saying it was it's very it's good, confusing but... some some of the Mandarin acting. But it's she yeah, she she was one of the right points in the film. Just pitched just right for that kind of crazy 
Yeah. Sort of thing. I, I, so yeah. There's nothing dreadful about it, but there's just nothing really, you know, why watch that when you could watch Dead or Alive? Why watch that when you mm. could watch Each of the Killer? Why watch that when you could watch Happiness of the Katakuras and... You know, yeah, he, this yeah, even yeah. has an animated sequence that has no place oh, in the fuck, I forgot about that. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it goes animated. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I loved it. It had, had happened to Katakura, so it had the bit of stop motion stuff at the beginning. Well, it was good, brilliant. It was consistent weird. in that film, though. It, this it was is, like, yeah. why, are you, why are you doing that? And I think they did that in the the other romance one that we couldn't remember what it was called. Oh, earlier. For Love's Sake. For Love's Sake, that yeah. had some stuff in... The, so you're probably right, yeah. Yeah, and I think that had and that didn't really work either. But I liked you talking about. I know the Mandarin was a bit off, but I one of the things I always like have liked about Mickey's movies mm. is the cosmopolitan. I agree the with fact that, that you definitely. get lots yeah. of people that aren't Japanese, so you get a Chinese kind of community here. And okay, they're gangsters, so but you know everybody's a gangster, so they're not really any worse off. And it's quite nice at the beginning because they're in a, a Chinese takeaway, yeah. and that's where one of the that's where he works. That's yeah, where yeah, Leo works, works, isn't it? Of course, yeah, yeah, he works. Yeah. As, it works in the kitchen kind of preparing some food and stuff. And um, and she's watching old gangster movies mm. and talking about honour and chivalry and, oh, that age is dead. And and that's kind of interesting because Mikkei's always had those gangster kind of things yeah, going yeah, on. Yeah, and yeah. they're it's usually nice pulled apart to. and shown how they're, they're flawed. So there's this nice little... Th- it's all it's very nostalgic. It just didn't develop on it. Though, it just, no, it just didn't really yeah. didn't I mean, have it, enough it, punch. And I, part of it seems like, you know, it's vaguely even sarcastic with Shota's character being... Yeah. The Yakuza guy who just couldn't, you know, kind of go, fuck, he's like playing this against this just for his own schemes, man. And it's, yeah, there's a slight, on the one hand, you can say there's a kind of like a sarcasm or I'm not going to say like fucking deconstruction of the genre, but. Oh, no, it it, but, at the same, but at the same time, it, well, it, it doesn't seem like he cared enough to go that far or not go that far. It's just because kind of Leo becomes away. the kind of heroic big brother, kind you of, know, yeah. character, doesn't he? He becomes that sort of. Mm. Uh, that classic kind of archetypal 70s Yakuza I'm yeah. strong and I'm stoic and I do the That's right thing stoic, even though I'm yeah, troubled yeah. and so she's but my, but my hair is immaculate that. but his hair is beautiful yeah it, so it, it, it doesn't, doesn't even move that much and he's good in the fight so we know there's that I still think that it's I still think it's bizarre that it's a romantic film and I, I I think the poster for the film as well is just it looks like like a Ghost in the Shell type anime poster manga poster does it for love's sake isn't it it's almost the same poster exactly mm. and I think that's gonna I mean it's okay but um I mean, I'm glad I, it's I been don't released, you know. And I, I think I think the anime kids will enjoy I, it. I don't think I, I don't think they because will because it's pop culture. Maybe they won't. Maybe it's not. It's not fluffy enough. I agree. It's, it's, not, one, it's not one. Thing it's not one. It's other. a nostalgia trip. I think is how I viewed it as a nostalgia trip. From me going, how much I loved his early films. Yeah. And finding things, finding similarities, and going, and also watching it going. Thank God it wasn't a steaming pile of shit. Thank God it wasn't <laughs> as bad as Blade of the Immortal. Thank God. And is that is a relief. Yeah. There's a relief that sometimes I watch these films now with a relief that they're not awful. Yeah, rather than being you. stellar and being as good as like Lesson of Evil. Great the, fucking film. The over the I do love that. Over Your Dead Body. Excellent film which as was well. Great. And you think he's making he's making this and then afterwards he'll make for love's sake. But, but this one was like in the in the can can directors for right. I mean, why? How? Because maybe he needs that he he deserves <laughs> recognition for being a good director, but you have to pick the film that he's just done, which unfortunately is the wrong one. You it's know, not, yeah. but it's not awful. It just, I think, given my knowledge of of how much I enjoy the early ones, you judge yeah. it against that. And of you course, go, yeah, it's yeah, not as it. violent as Each of the Killer. It's not as out there as Dead or Alive. It's not as it's not as quiet and as charming as Bird People. Or it, but it's, it's just it's, not romantic at all. Isn't and it, it isn't romantic <laughs> no. at all. It definitely, you, is not romantic. Just, you just, they don't even talk. It's not to like where you get like really good Sean Sonno movies, like Love Exposure. I do. I, I love saw... his stuff. And when he gets the. He gets the romance in. It's hyper real, and, yeah. but it's beautiful. Audition is a genuinely depressing film, and that's where he changed the novel so much. Like in the novel, it's a lot more straightforward. And mm. if you forget about the gore it's and true. everything, audition, audition is essentially like a really, really depressing. No, it's got a strong film. story. It's not. It's just, got a strong mm, story, but it, story it's in the film. It, he made it so much more depressing about like a complete lack of human connection or trust or anything. You know. That's, I mean, spoiler, yeah. I guess, but like, you know, there's a lot it, of lonely people in all these movies. Well, it, but at and the same time, like, it, you, when Ring and stuff were coming yeah. out, it was that whole, like, fear of human connection. And at the end of Audition, that's the only film I can think of where somebody wakes up at the end and it's, you know, a dream or whatever. That's the only film I can think of where that actually works for me. But yeah. I don't know whether he really ever captured that, that, like, wow, that depth mm. of story, of, of film craft, of storytelling. 
And it's like he's been made, he's made so much stuff that he watched Yuki Yaki I, I, and Django. That oh, was, I forgot about that, Jesus. It was just... Oh, oh that was a mess. And you, yeah, um, Yuki's Apocalypse. That's the Yuku's one. Yuki's Apocalypse. It was just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, oh, it was exciting to be Mickey and it was... Mm, and it had the kind of cool, the guy in the big teddy suit at the end. But you just went, huh, yeah. Yes, OK, thanks, Mika. Yeah, you, you can get yeah. back. It's well, like quirky, talking yeah, to a small quirky, child. Quirky, quirky, I agree with you. So that's, that's probably a good time to cut across the, the upcoming release of the One Missed Call trilogy. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. Oh, more sadness. We're talking about sadness and loneliness. There we go. No, I, I support All Miss Fun. I mean, I, 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 I actually, I still think One Call's not a bad film for him. I mean, it was... It was... It's very slick. It's very... In comparison to the stuff, it's very smooth. It's very... It's still pretty wack. It's, it's, it's very, it feels quite studio. It feels... It, in context, it, yeah. with, with what was going on, and, and, and it was at the height of that kind of J horror, you know. Kind it was, of, oh, let's make a great a time, film. a great time, a great time. But let's yeah. make a really slightly. I seem to remember the ending being had a sequence towards the end that was really striking. That made oh, that's interesting. But it was like right at the end. Of but the there, film, there's like that completely bizarre shot. like TV exorcism scene. scene yeah. in it. that's the, what the fuck. Where did that even come from? It's like suddenly somebody gets contacted. Like, oh, so can we do this in TV? Yeah, fuck. Where, I don't know. I just make just... the ring with the telephone. Okay, was... I... I know that's how horror works. You take a successful concept and you, but it, you put it. I mean, in it, it, was but basically... it, was a, it was a novel, which was it was before... a novel. And, oh, the, and, and the ring, uh... the ring films are nothing like the ring novels. I think one was called the problem. The only problem with one was called is too long. I mean, it's nearly two hours. Yeah, it's, it's nearly it's, two hours, it's but it's one hour fifty-two. Or... And the plot shifts around a lot, and there's a lot of. Mm. I still think there's some very cool stuff in there. But yeah, it just wasn't. I it's... think it was my first proper. Mika disappointment. So it, it, was the, it was the film where you saw him go. Because, like, you know, you've come, yeah. I say we've talked about this before, we've come true, off the true. back of each killer and Gozu and Family Q mm. and and Dead or Alive Gozu trilogy. Is. So many good, crazy, interesting, good films. And then you sit and you watch this, you're like. Yeah, but if you compare oh, it to the other like, J horror films of the era, this is still pretty fucking awesome. Absolutely, off no, me. absolutely. But. I think it was, you know, in hindsight now, you can go, well, he's made a lot of good films, he's made a lot of not very good films. Oh, definitely. And so, true. One Miss Call probably isn't definitely the worst he's ever made, but at that time, when your experience is you've had this really good run of films, and then you watch that, yeah. you can't help feel disappointed, well, so it's hard for me to separate disappointment. Oh, I, I agree with you about that. I, I never, that. I mean, I've got to admit, I never got to One Miss Call at the time, because it, it, it's like, when I, I heard about the plot, Oh, somebody gets a phone call that's like, well, let's ring. And the funny thing is, literally not, <laughs> yeah. there is literally not just one missed call. There's loads of the fucking calls, yeah. man. The title's a fraud. Uh, I mean, there's loads of missed calls, man. And honestly, how many times do you miss a call? Do you ever listen to your voicemail? I don't. The whole thing is like a telephone scam. It's, it's, it's a kind of clickbait thing, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. It's like the whole thing is that the ghost is just some mad spammer. Yeah. <laughs> when you click on my website, oh, check, follow yeah, me on Instagram. <laughs> I'm this mad fucking Japanese ghost, man. Good. Follow me, man. You know? Dan, he's probably got the script in development. <laughs> I still quite like to do I mean, I have to. Uh, it's good that it's getting a, a re-release. First Love will be released into selected UK cinemas from Valentine's Day, February the 14th, and will be released on home media on the 24th of February. As will the One Missed Call trilogy be released by Arrow on Blu-ray. Our team members, Maya and Kay, went to the International Film Festival Rotterdam. Here's part of their report. Hi, I'm Maya Kurbetska. And I am Kai van Zunen. And you're listening to the Eastern Kicks podcast. Um, so we're here uh, at the uh, uh, International Film Festival Rotterdam. For the past few days, we've seen at least three, four movies a day. <laughs> yes. So how are you hanging? Tired. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, but it's worth it. Yes, definitely. This, this year, the program is very diverse. Um, and there is definitely a lot of Asian representatives uh, in the program. As usual, yes. So, um, what did you see this year? Did, uh, are there any like um, major topics uh, that you observed in Asian cinema this year? Um, well, what uh, I saw, I, I guess I always concentrate also on the... Um, Indian films that are programmed, and I saw a lot of interesting regional cinema, both from the north 
the very north and the very south of the country? Yeah, yes. Uh, I mean, like India, China is huge. So maybe that's why like the differences um, between uh, the provinces and the differences between the north and the south are very, um, always very interesting to observe because they have like their different um, styles and um, dialects are very diverse. Like we both seen um, the home in the world today and bitter chestnuts, which is very interesting to compare to because the first one is like um, quite commercial genre cinema and the second one is an indie. So uh, what, do, what do you think about Wild Goose Lake? Ah, I've not seen that yet. Uh, well, how is it? Um, it is, um, um, actually it's, uh, it's part of this um, Southern tales. I mean, it was uh, shot in Wuhan, uh, which is, um, well, now um, a lot of people at the festival talks about the coronavirus and um, at the film market too, that um, there is this, um, a lot of filmmakers actually didn't come and Diao Yinan himself didn't come because of the coronavirus. Mm. Um, but anyway, Wild Goose Lake is very, um, it's an amazing film because it references a lot of um, 30s gangster films when it comes to the narrative and the style. And the, the filmmaker uses a lot of uh, shadows and a lot of strange camera angles that distort the reality. It has very violent moments and very funny moments. So this clash of two very um, extreme feelings uh, is very much um, characteristic for this film. When it comes to the story, it is again um, female-centered um, and um, very much stylized when it comes to space too, um, because it always rains. So uh, the neon lights get distorted through the rain, and um, mm. like when it comes to colors, it's very rich. Basically, it's like th there are a lot of parallels in the film, like between main character being chased after and them. Uh, there's one scene in the zoo with actual animals. And like, yeah, there is this kind of tragedy, but comedy just glued uh, very tightly uh, together. So yeah, you should go see it. <laughs> yeah. And you can hear the full report as the previous podcast to this one, episode 3A. The Wild Goose Lake is available to stream exclusively on Mumbi from the 28th of February. So moving on from a bit of J-horror, we're now going to chat about Takashi Shimizu, who's got a new film out in Japan right now called Howling Village. And for this, we're joined by Nina. Hello, Nina. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? Uh, yeah, um, I'm very excited about this film. Maybe for no reason, it might be completely terrible, but we shall see when it finally hmm. hits us here in the West. I don't know when that's going to be. Do you guys know? Is it um, has it been in a festival? So no, no. no, no. I, I, I think it, it, it played at a, a, a one festival late last year. Um, yeah. and it's come out, just come out. So. I, I've not heard yeah. any chat about it, like you know sales for it, distribution. I'd be pretty surprised if it got picked up for wide wide release. But I mean, we we can we can live in hope, I guess. But yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the thing. I, I, I mean, we can kind of come back to this. But there was a point where his films were getting regularly picked up and mm. I think not many of them have, have really come over to the UK even at, at festivals for quite a while now but yeah it's, it's, yeah, he, he's made there's been quite a well some of his recent not, ones which I haven't even managed to see like there's an innocent curse I haven't seen his Resident Evil one was uh, was that an anime? that's a, that's a, that's a an CG, one. CGI that's a, that, type he one? was producer on that actually if you look at Asian Wiki for instance it's not like he stopped making films he's mm. been doing films he's been doing segments and you know short movies and, yeah. and all along but none of them have really come over particularly commercially since Shock mm. Labyrinth Shock or, Labyrinth. Or Shock Labyrinth 3D. 3D. I mean, which version you watch? Who, who, yeah, man, who, that's, a, that's a truly terrible film. That's not a great yeah. film. Who, who Terracotta. Really Terracotta. Yeah. Um, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> mm. We're nothing bad about it. And then that was followed yeah. by 
Tormented. Tormented. Or, that was the, which, was the, which one had the rabbit? Which one? That's, that's well, Tormented. I mean, right. Because the okay. Japanese name is Rabito Horror. <laughs> <laughs> that's much better. Rabbit Horror. That would be much better than Tormented. Because that was, tormented was another. Terrible and that was a kind of that that had a bit of shock clever and finesse on a weird. I, I got. The, I admit it. I got those films confused at one point. Well, the, but, the, I mean, there's a there is a massive crossover. So. Yeah, even like the marketing materials, the posters and whatnot, were all pretty similar for those films. So, and neither was good. So. And then there was another American film. After the two Grudge remakes that he did, there was uh, another American film that took a while to actually get properly released, Flight 7500. Did that go under a different name somewhere at some point? I remember there was a uh, dark... Yeah, dark... it's like a snakes on a plane with a ghost, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I've seen it, but I can't... I have to be honest, like, a lot of the ones... It seems to have been delayed a couple of years. In, yeah, I, I, I think I've even, seen it, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Or is Kiki's Delivery Service, which I've never seen either. Yeah, that, that didn't get a lot of praise. Yeah. I, I think that's part of the problem where a lot of his work, in terms of being more internationally picked up I think that was the problem it got so badly received and I think mm. from what I read and this is kind of a while back but I remember a, a lot of people kind of said it was quite cheap looking <laughs> and I never saw it myself if you're going to try and pull off doing a live action version of yeah, yeah. The Studio Ghibli then yeah you, you have to re- do something you're gonna have own, to have this production you're going to have to make it in some ways at least have the kind of charm of the the anime, and if they just I, do a, like a bargain basement for uh, I mean, ironically, he's he was kind of a bit of a head of the curve, really, in making live action <laughs> versions of uh, animated classics. But yeah. I, the difference being the amount of money they put into those, mm. the, the, all those Disney ones that we're getting on a you know, kind of well, almost <laughs> bi monthly basis at the moment, yeah. and you know, and the fact that lots of those are actually completely scene for scene, yeah, versions of the animations. Mm. But he, yeah, he's done. Even apart from the grudge, he's done um, a lot of pretty interesting films. I mean, uh, all the um, you know, with apologies for pronunciation, Mar- Maribito. That, that's still one of my favorite of the whole you know wave of like Japanese horror films from the you know this century. Yeah, the stranger from afar. It was or, very, very. That's like that's an excellent one. Odd, <laughs> yeah, in but a good it, way. But yeah, it it takes. I had what, a you know uh, well. Tsukamoto. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's it's you know it takes what could be a kind of maybe a simple concept, makes it into something really weird, with kind of like video effects and everything mm. in there later. That, that's an amazing film. It's and it got released around internationally, and I think. I don't know, maybe that's one of the things about him. It's like his career, he has switched a lot between working within the genre, but switching between more commercial stuff, kind of slightly more bizarre stuff. And, you know, I mean, even The Grudge, like having its V Cinema origins and everything like that, it's, you know, it, it kind of found its fame and it grew, but it, it was never like originally like a, a big, you know, a big thing. I don't, yeah, I don't think a lot of people realize how uh, how big that whole franchise is. It's uh, actually mm. it's fourteen films in total. If you count all those like <laughs> two short films, it's, it's a lot of mm. films. That's a lot of mm. films. Yeah. I mean, like the last five have nothing to do with Shimizu himself. But mm. if you look at those, like, have you seen? Have you guys seen those first two short films? I've seen one of the two ones. With the one is that with like the really long title. Which has uh, like yeah, a lot of numbers the, in it the, and stuff. A lot of fours and then um, Katasumi. <laughs> uh, Katasumi, is, it's actually really creepy. It's four minutes long. I think it's less yeah. than four minutes, actually. And it's terrifying. It's, it's done on a cheap mm. and it happens in broad daylight. But, you know, it's, it's really well done. And um, it has, it's the first appearance by um, Takako Fuji, who, is the, uh, who plays Kayako in most of the films. Oh, it's the same actress who plays yeah. there. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. So yeah, I was I was quite surprised by them because they were just like cheap. They're part of a TV series. Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, I've, I've seen one of the two, but I haven't I haven't seen both of them. But I, you know, after seeing, you know, I saw obviously I saw them quite a long time after seeing, you know, the original Japanese grudge films and everything. Mm. So it's kind of, you know, because a lot of the series is pretty, you know, similar. It's kind of subsumed into one long long grudging. I guess yeah, that's all yeah. well. no, no, I don't even in a bad way. I, I, I like the Grudge. Show. I mean, I think the series is a lot more even than you know the Ring Ringu series. Mm, everything. Definitely. So it's the Grudge just never really strays too far from its path. Yeah. It kind of yeah. sticks to yeah. what it does. Even like I, you know, I quite enjoyed the you know the new US reboot slash remake slash whatever it is. I still quite enjoyed that as well. It's still worth checking out. If you if you like the grudge, you're probably gonna like it. If Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a completist here. I, I do need to see it because I'm still <laughs> like balance. 
It's pretty good, and it's got a good it's got a good director behind it as well. But it does have the credit, like based on the original characters from the original Japanese film, not based on the remake. Even though obviously he you know directed the remake, the first two remakes. Mm. Uh, it's very very old fashioned though, so cool. I'm not too surprised it wasn't a big success. It, yeah. you know, for the for the young kids of today, it's still she you know oh, Kayako and they're still up to their old nonsense. They're doing exactly the same thing they always do, but there is more gore in it. There's quite a lot more blood cool. in it, which is slightly surprising, but. It's good film, good director. It should have should have really done better than it did, I think. But I mean, so it's already out of cinemas now. I, guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a one one week in the cinemas type job. I, I think it has something a bit more like four point something on IMDb. So yeah, it hasn't hasn't uh, been a critical success at least. It didn't. No, it, it was both a commercial and critical failure, unfortunately. Um, which is a shame for the director because you know he's he's one of the sort of upcoming indie horror American directors who's done some really good stuff before so it's, it's mm. kind of a shame for him as well it, but it was kind of a funny time for it to come out though as yeah it, it was, it was, it was I mean, I mean, in the same way that Rings was a little while back because it wasn't mm. really anything fueling that here that was no the, that's true yeah. or, or in the states like yeah, the, yeah there was no real context for you know a wild a wide international release of a new grudge film yeah, it just kind of came out of nowhere, to be honest. I, I, mm. It was kind of completely under my radar, and all of a sudden it just kind of was released, I think, was it before Christmas in the US? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I didn't kind of expect it at all but to see a new crutch film. Uh, maybe the last for a while, unfortunately. <laughs> <Possibly>. unfortunately. <laughs> Although even in Japan, like, some of the, you know, the some of the recent, more recent ones, well, whereas the ring still seems to attract, you know, plenty of funding for all the, you know, the Sadako... Sadako 3D, Sadako 3D2, or then in just Sadako. They still seem to be fairly big budget ones, where even like the other grudge ones, you know, like Beginning of the End, the Final Curse, they were still pretty low budget affairs. Mm. Mm. They were cinema releases, yeah. but they looked pretty they looked pretty direct to video. But you know the series in the West had gone the what well, the grudge three and four, they they were direct to direct to like video or direct to streaming at that point. So it's yeah, it's kind of a, an odd one to resurrect without any fanfare, just to throw it out there in cinemas and kind of hope people remember. Yeah, just kind of hope that there's still that fan base out there. To, I mean, there is, obviously. There's people like me who, who <laughs> will watch them. But, you know, yeah, if, if you're trying to attract a new audience for it, it, yeah, it kind of... There was no effort to try and do that, I think. Yeah. Not, not through anything I saw. At least when they did the awful uh, Rings, or whatever it was a few years ago, I said, yeah. that's a terrible film. But they, they, oh, they yeah. did... For better or worse, well, for worse, they, they did try and like bring in like the younger audience, try up the game by having her. She attacked people on a plane, like suddenly everyone mm. on the airplane is watching. I mean, it's that yeah, ambitious. and that sequence is completely out of it's nonsense. It's, it's nothing that. to do with the rest <laughs> of the damn film. It's, it's, it's just, like they went, oh, we need something. We, need something <laughs> yeah. to stop this film we got to prove that Sadako or Tamara, or whatever Samara, or whatever she's called in the the U.S. remake. We got to prove she's up to her game. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I saw. I mean, this is gonna. It's it's on topic, but slightly off. I saw like a really weird one. Somebody had a link uh, for one of these like weird Chinese knockoffs, where it's like you know, Bunchen Saba versus mm. Sadako. What? Uh, yeah. it's like, yeah. But it, but it's a completely unlicensed cheap Chinese song. <laughs> but apparently on. apparently they do actually fight like fist fight in it as well. They properly have a go at each other. So oh, that sounds amazing. That sounds very good. So I have. Bunchen Saba isn't actually a half bad film that's actually okay that's a decent film as well yeah. so even, that was the worst thing about like Sadako versus Kayako even when they're they're fighting it wasn't you know they weren't really fighting very yeah. much they, yeah. if they actually just even if they had an argument about yeah. who's victim <laughs> or there's something there was almost like no engagement and then suddenly they were you know spoiler alert suddenly you know combined into another mad ghost together which mm. was half of each of them but was a bit just stupid which is as just Completely, <laughs> completely with forgotten the, about with, uh, <laughs> the last Sadiko film, which was awful. Yeah. I mean, whoever thought like bringing back like a, you know Nakata Hideo was not paying attention to how bad most of his recent films have been. <laughs> it's, it's harsh. Whereas at least the Grudge sticks to its guns. I mean, it, it will do exactly the same thing in every single film, but it sticks to it. You know. I think there's some uh, like some films on the Grudge franchise that uh, need more love than they're getting. Like um, hmm. the. Juon 2, uh, the Japanese uh, sequel, is, is actually a really good film. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of like, like Jaws 2 is almost as good as the first one. <laughs> yeah. And be, yeah. people always forget it. Nobody ever seen it. They I do like Jaws 2, that's true. But what did you think of the, the, the US remix then, which he directed himself at like 1 and 2? Um, I mean, the, the first is okay. I mean, it's, it's a little bit pointless because it's so similar 
to the mm. original one, other than the, I mean, it's missing some of the story arcs and it's not quite as fractured. But I think in... even he said that, because he, he, I, I read an interview where he said, when they asked him to do the, the second film, was, mm. well, okay, so I've, I've already done a rerun of, of the first film. Yeah, that's so true. So he said, third. I don't want to do a rerun of the second mm. film. Yeah, fair enough. Cause it was, but it was like Sam Ramay's Ghost House and everything who produced it, and Roy Lee, who was at that time remaking, you know, well, you know, financing remakes from pretty much every property, everything. So it was, I don't know, that, that was an interesting time where, where people were clamoring for these like, Asian horror remakes and stuff. But mm-hmm. I, I preferred the Grudge remakes to, I mean, Ring, the Gore Verbinski one, was good, but it was much longer. It was, it was way too long a film, and it was all a bit Marilyn Manson and whatnot. <laughs> uh, and then the second, you know, the Ring, Ring 2, directed by Nikita Hidium, so it was yeah. awful. Yeah, Jesus, is, Jesus, it is, man. It is really awful. In I mean, some ways, that's the worst of all of these Ring or Grudge films. That is yeah. just, Jesus. The Grudge to the, the American uh, version is at least watchable. I mean, it's not good by any standards. It's okay. I don't, I don't think it's too bad. I, I, I think I, those, I really, those two ones... I dislike that they try to kind of give Kayako this kind of, some kind of backstory. That, that was the and, trend at the time, I guess. But and it I, just, it doesn't fit in with the rest of the story. She doesn't need a backstory. She already has a backstory why she's a vengeful ghost. Mm. And I really dislike it. And because it doesn't, it's not actually followed up in a film in any way. It's just kind of there in the middle <laughs> of it and then it's just forgotten. That's, it's true, but I mean, they did that in a Japanese. I mean, when you get to the like the beginning of the end and the final curse, that's kind of what they they did with those ones as well. It was kind of a semi reboot, but not. And they seem to be like trying to justify a, a vaguely different backstory for her. But mm. then, as soon as she started, you know, she went full grudge. They they, you know, they weren't very interested in it either. I think that's one of. The, I mean, that is yeah, that's one of the best things about the first two. You know, not the the shorts, but like the first, you know, the grudge and the grudge too. Is that yeah, they they just kind of dispense with it and that's one of the reasons why they are you know right creepy in that mm. it's because it doesn't yeah, yeah. have this you know very like a convoluted mythology and everything around mm. it and everything it just kind of happens and it doesn't really matter if you're innocent or not she doesn't really have a motive for doing stuff whereas you know compared to ring everything she always had some mad schemes and that like for the grudge i think that's why it was you know more frightening in a way is because it was just a random thing you went into the house sorry <laughs> that's, that's it, it. That's, that's it, it. Yeah, you're no, done yeah, the it's, days are numbered but I, Anyone be, can yeah. be a victim there. It's, exactly, uh, but I think the Japanese films got caught up in in trying to find extra content and stuff just as much as the American ones did. And, yeah, and for him as well, like you said, like by that stage, whether he was like producing, directing, stuff, he was probably bored of just doing exactly the same story again. Mm. So you know, they just got caught up a bit, and that was a fantastic period to be like a fan of like Asian horror cinema. They had so much, even if we. You know, kind of expand that stuff like the eye coming out and everything, all those other films. Like that was that was a very good time for films, you know. And I'm not sure we'll see that kind of coming again or anything. Yeah. Like with even these, you know, these films are not making as much money, you know, domestically. I think it kind of. It, I guess the thing is that that it was incredibly, you know, and having spoken to some of the people who were producing a lot of these films, mm. you know, especially this kind of pan Asian kind of idea of you know, it might be Japan, it might be Thailand, it might be Hong Kong. Yeah. You know that people like Peter Chan. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it well, was the whole very, very stuff and everything. The, the, you know, when you had the three, you know, the two mm, of those, everything, three, three, shutter, three. every, yeah, absolutely, it was a. But I think it it, it kind of reached peak. Mm. But you think it could have peaked again? That's like twenty years ago, almost. You know, it's it's a shame that it hasn't come back again, and it's it's hard to see it actually managing. It's it's been a while since we had like a real proper. You know, good, refreshing, you know, ghost story from from somewhere in Asia. I think I, I can't remember the last one which I saw, which was really, really good. And maybe Howling Village will. You, did, did you watch that first eight minutes of it? I I did. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. How was it like? It, it looked interesting. Um, it had a couple of uh, nice kind of spooky bits with uh, something kind of in the background and then disappears and then it goes a bit crazy. But uh, yeah, it. Uh, I mean, it piqued my interest, definitely. So, I mean, I could just say, I mean, you can watch the first eight or so minutes online at the moment. Um, I think it's quite interesting that it starts with very much of a a homage to, very deliberate homage to Blair Witch found Mm. footage. Nice, I love you. I love my found footage. I mean, actually kind of, it it very quickly kind of drops that and then it's it's actually kind of very sharp, professional, Mm. slick looking horror. Is it really in a village? And it's... It, it seems to be about a village. I mean, this is yeah, the thing. Um, it, it, it's based on an actual uh, Japanese urban legend um, okay. of Inunaki village. 
which is kind of said to be a village somewhere in the countryside. You can only access through this uh, tunnel. And uh, there's a there's a sign on a gate saying uh, the laws and constitutions of Japan don't apply here. Hmm. Um, apparently saying, like, the villagers were, like, incest practicing cannibals or something. <laughs> there, there, was no, there was another film, there was a couple of other films about that before, um, or, or, or linked to that, it was like Kakashi, there was a, and there was another one which had a very similar name to the, the village, like, you know, back during the, like, the, this whole boom phase of it. I, I can remember, it, it reminded definitely me a bit remember, of like, X going through the tunnel. X cross, yeah, yeah, X cross yeah. is, yeah, exactly. I, you're right. I think yeah, yeah. there was probably like maybe some mini boom based yeah. around that one legend. I think I remember que- clearly a few films were like going through the whole tunnel and everything that and seeing a sign about stuff like so. That's quite. A, then, then there was that whole video game series. Um, was it Red Siren? Whatever it was, mm-hmm. which was that. I mean, which was more frightening than any of those films. That was a. <laughs> that, that was going to one of these villages and just yeah. That that was a creepy game. Being an old man, it also reminded <laughs> me of um, one of the segments in the Monster Club, a segment sure. called The Ghouls, and that's where somebody travels into a village and through the fog, and they can't. Uh, so this Vincent, is a memory from um, having watched it about so Vincent, twenty-five years Vincent ago. Price, Christopher, the, yeah, together in that film. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I haven't watched. That. There was a disco dancing sequence in that film, though. There's bound to be, yeah. <laughs> so um, it was nice eighty one, but yeah, I mean, I remember that, and they kind of get. You know, there's this kind of ghouls that come after them once again, so they just kind of get trapped there. Yeah, I remember, jeez, I do remember that. It's just going back, it was going back a bit. But I mean, that's, I mean. <laughs> was that when you were a young lad in the 60s? <laughs> 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 ah, young lad in the early 80s. Watching zombie flesh eaters and <laughs> the beyond. Dr. Terror's House of Horrors. <laughs> <laughs> and Hammer Good House of on the telly. Hammer all House, solid yes. choices. <laughs> I don't know, but we'll see where all this stuff goes with yeah, Japanese. Yeah. I, I mean, every, I would love to see a revival in it because it was, I mean, that kind of horror when it was at its peak was influencing cinema all, all around the world at that time. Absolutely. You, you know, whether it's European, you know, American, it, it had such a huge impact, and which you can still see, still see today. Hello, my name is Adam Terrell, and I run. Uh, Third Window Films, which has been distributing Asian cinema for about uh, 15 years or so, and this is uh, how I got into Eastern Flicks. The film that I guess really got me into Asian cinema, I mean, I'd been into cinema very passionately since I was very, very young, but when I was about, uh, I think, 11 or 12 years old, um, I was living in uh, Sarasota, Florida. I'm I'm English, but I was uh, living in, in Florida at the time with my mother. And I was desperate to, uh, there was a film festival at a local cinema there called Burns Court Cinema. And they had a film festival every year and I would try to go. And um, this year they, when this museum is probably about 1991, uh, they were playing uh, Prison on Fire 2. And it uh, looked looked, uh, very, very fun. And uh, I think it was probably the first time I'd seen a film like that, Uh, definitely, definitely first Hong Kong film or, or probably a first Asian film from what I can remember to be honest and uh, I saw it with an eye to, because I was only 11 or so years old at the time I had to um, ask my, my, my mother to take me because uh, I wasn't able to see uh, I think it's probably an R-rated film by myself so I, I asked my mother to go with me and uh, I saw it and it, it totally blew me away I mean uh, I, I think if you're young and, and you've never seen a film like that before it's I mean it's totally mind-blowing I mean the action and, and everything that was never really something like this heroic bloodshed that we had never really seen in, uh, in Western cinema and uh, I saw it, it it totally changed my my perception of, of uh, film at the time and I got from then on I was hooked on, on uh, Hong Kong cinema and I would buy every Tai Seng VHS tape that I could find and started hoarding as many at the time Hong Kong films. Of course, that was Prison of Fire 2 that I saw, so I saw Prison of Fire 1 and then started seeing, you know, all the other Ringo Lam, John Woo, Choi Hark, all those films, all the heroic bloodshed, Chow Yun Fat films of, of their time. And I think most people who are my age now probably did the same thing. And that got me into 
to Asian cinema. From there, I branched out, obviously, into different aspects of, of Asian Asian cinema, such as you know Japanese and Korean, and uh, and then you know I started wondering why I, it was so hard to track down these films uh, and and why there weren't more people distributing them. And in time, that's what started Third Window Films. And Third Window Films is is based on my I guess all came from me first seeing Prison on Fire to in a small cinema in, uh, in, in a small town in, in Florida. So that's uh, what started my, my passion for Asian cinema and it, it's, it has never cooled since. So uh, all thanks to uh, Ringo Lam, I guess. Let's move into Eastern picks. Eastern Do picks. we have any picks that have uh, recent releases on streaming? So, uh, for me, what's kind of interesting at the moment is so the fact that suddenly all the Studio Ghibli titles just landed yeah. on, uh, on, on Netflix. Netflix. After them specifically yeah. saying a while ago, they were never going to sell it to stream. Mm-hmm. And now everything is on there. Well, what's good? Is, is every GB film on there? So it's, it's going I, well, in stages. Well, so two two waves, right? Two, two or three waves. Three waves. Three, three waves. waves. So okay. February, March, April, I believe, they're releasing, basically going to release all the kind of back catalogue. I think random ways. Mo- a lot of the heavy hitters are there, right? like Totoro, everything. They're already on there, everything, which is... Okay. And it's my leg, okay, and... But, but now, also, the, but the, the other part of this is that, because, you know, as we know, it's owned by Disney, who now have their own streaming channel. Um, and this is not yep. being released in the US or in Japan. This is just UK? So this is, this is Netflix yeah. around the world, apart from UX and Japan, I believe. Okay. Yeah. That's quite widespread then. So as, as far as I know, it's quite widespread. But you know, it's, it's you know there's a thing about that. It's like it feels like they've in the UK market, for instance, we've reached saturation. I would expect in the people who are going to buy a physical media of of yeah, Ghibli films. I reckon. We've had the DVDs. We've had the Blu-rays. We've had I mean, Zappy yeah. special editions, steelbooks. You know what else? They, is they are household names now. Household names. Who who the fuck wants a steelbook of Totoro? Honestly, I mean Totoro made, made it into Toy like Story, story didn't it? Sorry? Totoro made it into Toy Story. That's true, but like it's that. it's a, not the kind of film I would watch. So no, but but it's that. recognition that normally Japanese culture is niche and is reserved for fans of Japanese culture and Japanese movies, whereas Ghibli has broken down that. Boom, with a barrier. Yeah. Yes, there's a there's comparisons with Disney in terms of animation quality and mm-hmm. beautiful, but obviously there's a, so much more depth to Miyazaki's films, and Disney has the, the politics, the environment. I mean, I'm, I'm not a fan, to be honest it, with but, you. I, I oh, he's no, yeah, he's good. Has anyone watched Tokyo Midnight Diner? Which it's not, it's not a new thing. It's not a new release on Netflix. Is it a series or a film? I love it's it series, to death. It's so yeah. wonderfully heartwarming. Um, I'm heartwarming. I'm already no, in, it's so. beautiful. Tokyo Midnight Diner. <laughs> It's a, it's a little t- TV show. It's been on Netflix for a while. They've just started the second series. Okay. Um, little half an hour segments. It's uh, as it's, it's, it's What's suggests. What's the like, basically? It's, so it's, uh, as, it, as the title might suggest, it's a little diner that opens after midnight. So here's this guy, and he opens his diner for midnight, and he says, I'll cook anything you like. Um, and basically different people come into the diner, and you hear Is their stories. Is it No, not at all. He's just, he's up, he's just, it's like an all-night cafe, I suppose, if the English equivalent would be. And he's, we don't know much about him yet. He's got a scar, so my guess is that he's probably been in some trouble and now he's settled down and he runs a diner. And you don't know much, it's not really about him and a diner. Mm. They do a different food each week, so, and they'll have different, normal, everyday people coming in. That sounds like the kind of of thing that my wife loves to watch, this kind of different food kind of things coming in, a different kind, is it kind of like different Japanese kind of? Yeah, so they'll uh, economy arky kind of episode or something. Yeah, yeah. Like, so know. they'll they'll have different they'll have a different dish, and someone will come and ask for a particular dish, and we'll find out what their story was. So there's lots of, I mean, it, it's it's really. That's it's terrible. Really, it's no, gorgeous. see, I like the sound. Right. I really like. Okay, the sound. so I think that's, I think that's depends what what Fucking kind of mood you're in. So <laughs> it feels to me it's very. I haven't done enough research on it, but I'm convinced it feels very much like a live action anime or manga. So it's got that kind of very. Kind of. There was, do, like, do there was like two films about it, right? There was one or two films. Oh, about I don't know. I'm just. Yeah, there I'm was definitely a film with that. I haven't watched them. There may be. But. There was. Mm. Um, but it, it, there's something very Japanese about that Films kind of nostalgia later. and the tweeness. But it's really, it's really hard. How could, could tweeness ever be a good fucking thing? Yeah, it's good. Honestly. It's because Tokyo Mid, you watch Tokyo Mid and Dino, and you know. May as well move to the, so the Cotswolds. So my, one of my favorite episodes. Midsummer Murders. So it's a really good one of my favorite episodes was. 
they had a guy come in and he was part of a tokusatsu series in the 70s and and now he you know his series is he's not doing anything now and he feels like oh he's unknown and by chance his fan club kind of comes in and it mm. reaffirms his confidence and stuff and there's stuff like that that's really kind of in any other situation Japan seems to do quite well is to do these really kind of slightly cheesy nostalgia heavy kind of feel good shows <laughs> Well, that's it for this episode. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. And you can also find us on easonkicks.com, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. Do get in touch if you'd like to let us know how we're doing or if you've got some ideas for future episodes. Next episode, we will be covering King Who. Very nice. Classic uh, filmmaker. Good night, and let's say cheers. Jumbo. I'll see you again, Gambe. Gambe. Get it, don't you? Ha <laughs> ha.